just want to input you, Ernst, we've lost you again, but we can hear you. Ernst, can you just try if you can hear us? Just say hello, please. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Just want to give an input to you. All right, but let us start this. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever part of the world you are in. I hope you're safe. I hope you're healthy. And welcome to the Forasters Global Meeting, where I think the best, the best of the world come together. We are very honored to be here to be discussing how do you guide trust building in new business ventures in these troubled times. And I'm very, very lucky to have an all-star panel with me over here today to uh, discuss this very, very important part, because a lot of times businesses end up understanding that trust is the most important factor when it comes to creating businesses and ventures. And of course, many a time, it's an intangible. So how do you determine that? That becomes very, very important. So let us start this. Uh, how this will move forward is we'll all be introducing ourselves and we'll move to the questions and answers after that. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Professor Aditya Singh. I'm the director of the Athena School of Management, which is a global business school based out of Mumbai in India. Uh, of course, I teach differential th thinking, leadership, entrepreneurship, and digital transformation in business schools across the world. And I have the good fortune of also being a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society, the Royal Society of Arts, and of course, the Chatham House, all in the UK. I am honored over here to have panelists from all across the world over here. So we have people right from Nigeria in Africa, to Shanghai, to Hong Kong, uh, to Poland, temporarily in Spain, to, of course, the Netherlands, and, of course, yours truly in India. So I'd like to start and invite each of the panelists to introduce themselves and have an opening statement. And I would like to start off with Greg. So, Greg, the floor or the screen is all yours. Thanks, Adija. Yeah, okay. So the opening statement, I think, is, is more just a little bit about us. And um, a lot of my, my career and my time has been spent in the insurance industry and sitting on a number of international insurance boards. And, uh, and of course, um, we're all about trust. Uh, if the companies, if insurance companies don't have trust, they don't have clients in the first place. And, uh, and one has to make a distinction in a way uh, between a life insurance company and a general insurance company. Uh, so a life insurance company um, often issues policies to people that uh, – um, usually they're not around when it comes to have to pay out. So there's there's huge trust on the part of the individual who's buying the policy that the insurance company will honour what they want after they're gone from this world. Uh, whereas in the case of general insurers, of course, it's much more short term. And uh, and as I'm sure some of you know, uh, the trust element is, is much harder to, to generate uh, because people are always talking about, oh, insurers don't pay claims, etc. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, another thing that, that we're doing is uh, I have a, actually a, a corporate services company with a trust license and, uh, and in a way that's, that's very similar. So, so a lot of my background relates to to trust and uh, and being able to not only build trust, but to maintain trust. Thanks, Greg. Stephanie, why don't you just jump in? Uh, thank you, Aditya. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Koka Rank, and uh, I'm a Nigerian and born entrepreneur with close to two decades of experience in building and managing business in the executive search, uh, music, entertainment, and fashion industry across Europe, Africa, Russia, and the CIS. Uh, currently, as a partner at DMD Consulting, an executive search boutique, uh, I serve clients in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as companies and investors with business interests in Africa. These include the largest private equity funds, development financial institutions, and impact investment funds. And in this capacity, I've expanded uh, our client portfolio, led the search, attraction and hiring of senior executives for both the clients, investment teams, as well as portfolio companies across a variety of sectors, um, which includes uh, consumer goods, healthcare, education, food and beverage, financial services, manufacturing, real estate, infrastructure and technology. I'm very passionate about impact, diversity, and I mean diversity in all its senses, be it cultural, educational the mindset, gender, and particularly diversity in life experiences. I believe this is significant uh, in impacting our values, goals, aspirations, vision, and purpose, as well as the style of communication and partnership with others. 
which is key to developing and building trust. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, puts a lot of things in perspective. Ernst, you are associated with startups and uh, with a lot of environments as it is in the Netherlands. Why don't you tell us something about yourself and what your belief in this? Yeah, thanks, uh, Aditya. And, uh, and this is a theme close to my heart. So um, my background is about 15 years in corporates, uh, and about 10 to 12 years in entrepreneurship. Um, being an entrepreneur, scaling up business, uh, being an investor, um, uh, as such, uh, as also, I'm currently the CEO of Erasmus Enterprise, which is also uh, providing a community and an ecosystem for, um, let's say, ventures to flourish. And um, the, the elements to this, uh, uh, one, one important cornerstone to that one is trust. Um, so in, in my uh, different roles and capacity, you could, uh, you could argue, so, you know, what is trust in, in, in this perspective, especially in ventures and startups and scale-ups? Um, and it's probably the only asset that some of these startups have. So you have to really nourish that. You have to be able to see sort of what is the traction that a potential venture can have. Um, and, that, and that exemplifies in, 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 in elements like, uh, you know, your supplier agreements, your client agreements. How does the team do? How to correlate? How to work together? Um, as well as, you know, have to be in first investors who actually believe in um, that adventure can move to the next level. And so trust is an essential element to it. And there's a Dutch saying in that, you know, um, trust uh, comes on a, you know, on, on a normal pace, but it runs off by horse, right? So it, you, you, can, you can lose it uh, very, very quickly. And one of the key elements, let's say, in venture development and startup development is very much about these incremental steps that uh, that ventures can take. So don't say sort of, hey, we're going to change the world. No, um, you know, my first client might be in three months' time on a pivot or a pilot uh, project, um, and they probably don't pay for it. But if you deliver on that one, you build the trust to the next level. So take those incremental small steps, and that, uh, whether you call it agile, lean startup, uh, uh, design th thinking from time to time, all of those add up to this level of trust attraction. Uh, second element to that, if you take the other, if you take the flip side of the uh, of this one, what happens into the world? You know, everything is shifting, so you have to be able to uh, take a realistic view on that. What what I would call the big shift, right? Things are sh shifting from the business model from uh, products from services so you have to be able to um, building trust is also to have a realistic view of what's happening in the future yeah? and and I think we have, we have seen it recently sort of uh, Conoco Phillips uh, Shell actually the shareholders telling them stop stop uh, you know uh, 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 producing oil be a sustainable citizen and, and, and I think it's also there so hey you would still have trust in the brand but you're not you know, and, and trust in, in that they can accommodate. Uh, also, that one is, um, you know, I would say sort of trust in building ventures is exemplifying and how much the world is shifting. That's it. Thanks, Ernst. Alex, why don't we take it forward with you now? Oh, hello. Happy to speak. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I have more than 30 years of experience in business, but I had uh, developed really four different professions across this time. I started as a business lawyer, then I get bored, then I became investment banker, then I get bored, then I became uh, uh, an executive manager, then I get bored, then I became an investor. Uh, I got bored a little bit as well, and then I became an executive coach, uh, finishing yet another study. So uh, all of this jobs which I had, all this task which I had, had a little bit different view about trust. But the most interesting is connected with psychology. So it's really the coaching part, the psychological part, because trust is not about logic. Trust is about emotions, about our feelings. Yeah? Whether we trust or don't trust somebody, it doesn't really result from the fact that yeah, this, we have data. Yeah? We, we, we don't have data. I mean, we may have data. It's useful to have data. But at the end of the day, this is our feeling. Uh, and we all know that after years, when we remember somebody, 
some sort of a situation, we wouldn't remember what was said, but we would remember how we felt with this person. Uh, so, so trust is deeply rooted into psychology. Trust is deeply rooted in our being sort of a pack animal, evolved, yeah? evolved pack animal, but we are still pack animals. And as such, we normally rather don't trust than we trust. Why it is so? Well, the explanation is very simple. Evolution was not promoting those who trusted. Yeah, if you imagine some Homo erectuses many, many, many years ago running to savanna, and there was something resembling a tiger. And then the first, the first guy or the lady was thinking, hmm, tiger, run and run. And the second started thinking, oh, maybe it's a nice kitty or maybe the, 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 the. I mean, who was actually promoted by the evolution? Yeah? The second one typically would get eaten. Yeah, so we are living in a world right now that is still full of our evolutionary habits, but they are not necessarily helping in the contemporary world. So this is important to understand when we talk about trust, yeah? that trust is something which we try and should get into the logical level, but it's hard. That's hard because we are still emotional beings. We are still the pack animals and we are still formed by our evolution. So this is something I just want to, I know it may strange, sound strange for somebody, but this is really what the science is telling us. Yeah. Trust, emotions, evolution. Thank you for that uh, very interesting example. And I'm going to remember the, the saber tooth tiger and the kitty very, very well as an example. I can tell you that much. Uh, but moving on. Jesse, I mean, uh, you're from Shanghai, even an entrepreneur. Why don't you share with us your inputs and your experience? Okay, it's my turn. I'm Jesse. I'm based in China. You know, uh, I I have ten years in entrepreneurship experience, but my recent uh, complaints about baby industry. I do baby stroller in the past five years. And uh, <clears throat> my market is China, America, and uh, Europe. So I think my daily work is about trust because baby industry all about trust, right? So I need to deal with many things, you know, design, uh, material, the structure, the branding communication. It's all about trust. But uh, for a team, you know, from best in China, but our market is uh, international market. So it's uh, really a big challenge for us how to build a trust in the worldwide market for a Chinese, market, Chinese team. So I will ex explain, you know, more uh, in the later about uh, in the following the, I will explain more, you know, through the question. But I also want to share some more about trust during the COVID, because I create two brands in the past five, five years. But last year during COVID, I left my first brand. I create my new brand. So that's really total new venture for me. Uh, it's very tough to have some new, new business during COVID. Uh, I think uh, my experience tell me, you know, in the past one year, I do all the things based on the trust I create, create in the baby in the industry. Like, uh, uh, the customer, you know, I communicate with the customer. My brand, you know, our founder team is from blah, blah. This is the first brand name because the first brand name is very famous in China. So we communicate with customer. We are from a brand. The brand is already very famous in China and the uh, when I work with a supplier, you know, for new business, you don't have so many resources. 
So you need your trust to convenience your supplier, your your distributor. You know, you can do you can do very good job so they can cooperate with you, give you much support. And uh, I think another thing very important about trust is trusting your team, your team trust. So in the tough time, in the tough year, for a new company, you must have many problems and difficult, but your team trust you, trust the company can figure out the problem, can have brighter future. That's very important. But all are based on trust. Okay, that's what I shared. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for that. And building on that, uh, you know, and I would wa want Ernst to take this question first because obviously he is now with the Erasmus Enterprise, which is into entrepreneurship, staff versus How do you create trust when you're developing a new venture? When obviously there is no status quo, there's no, no background. So how do you end up creating that trust? Yeah, thanks uh, for the question, uh, Aditya. Um, it is increasingly difficult for startups also to um, to you know elevate them from the from the, from the pack. You know, it's nowadays you have to build something unique, um, and, um, and 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 there's a couple of elements that makes successful uh, startups stand out from, from the crowd. And one of which is very much, and I, I think Jesse was alluding to that one, you know, uh, the importance of a team, right? So it, it is the elements, it's the individual elements of the team members that should um, add up to a venture that is, that is you know, sticking out from, uh, fr uh, from, fr from the crowd. In, in, in this one, um, you know, it, it's very easy that most of the startups actually fail because the, the, the founders are too hard-headed to take advice, to talk to the suppliers, to talk to the clients or the potential clients in an effective way. And, and, and often and you can say, sort of, oh, you were too early in the business or the investors, oh, they just missed out on something. No, it's really about that individual. And it's probably 90% of that one is related to trust. Why would you give somebody part of your money uh, if you do not trust the founder, you know, and, 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 and this is essential. And that, that, that adds up to, you know, also large size business and then they end up, uh, you know, shareholders on, on, on the stock exchange. But I think it's very much around the team. And if you know that this big shift that we talked about earlier, if, if you know that is going to, to happen, trust is an essential element. And, 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 and I just see that sort of with all of my enterprise, uh, Erasmus enterprise, you know, at university, people have a very sort of naive idea uh, that they will make tons of money on, on starting, uh, starting to become an entrepreneur. They really have to bootstrap, you know, for two, three, four years, bootstrap meaning that they give up everything to accomplish that dream uh, in, in order to, to, to build on the future. And every element in that one is, is, is related to trust. So they deliver on these small incremental steps, but it also gives you the bad message. Okay, we fucked up. Sorry for my French in this one, but we really messed up in this one. Um, you know, please, you know, continue to trust us because we, we're open and, and, and that one. So to venture building, uh, trust is really important. It very much around the team. You know, a bad idea with a good team can, can do everything. A good idea with a pretty poor team, you know, where there's a lack of trust or who are not integer, we don't, who do not have the integrity, and that would not be an accelerant for you in your portfolio to change. So trust on venture building is essential. Thank you, Ernst. And taking the lead from Ernst, Stephanie, because I know you have a lot of experience in building your own ventures, but at the same time, you're right now into executive search and talent hunting. Where does that entire thing come into play when you're building up a new venture, when it comes to building trust, even down to attracting the best possible talent for something which perhaps is only a dream or a figment of one's imagination and passion? Thank you, uh, Aditya. 
Um, I would like to use an example of my personal experience uh, to answer this question. And then I will touch also on the question referring to uh, the executive search aspect uh, of, of my, my business. So my shift from the music and fashion industry to executive search uh, took building and gaining the trust of my business partners, clients and growth markets, investor community as a whole. And to achieve this, there were, I would say, a few things that really helped me achieve this. And one of that is authenticity. You know, when we're authentic, this makes people feel comfortable. It makes them open. It makes them empathetic towards us. And it also makes it easier to create an environment where you can actually communicate and share those aspects of yourself in return. And I think this is one of the key points that really provides an initial yet a very strong foundation in building relationships that can promote trust. OK, um, empathy is something that is key. You know, when you're communicating or starting a new business venture, your devoted attention to your first conversation or encounter is so important and showing that you are able to have the capacity to understand challenges, the needs uh, of your potential partner or client, and having that patience uh, as well in actually understanding those needs, uh, which sometimes can be either clear or even unclear to, to, to the clients in particular. I think that's very important because people feel that you're making that effort. Then transparency, I think, is something that's very important. You can't, you need to be very clear on what you can deliver. You need to be very clear on what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses. Also, showing a bit of vulnerability around what is it that you're not good at, because you'll be surprised how often people actually value that, um, because you're putting yourself in a position whereby you could actually uh, not have the opportunity to close a certain deal or a certain partnership because you are showing aspects in which you are not strong or that are not your strengths. However, this automatically opens up someone else towards the fact that you are, you have integrity, um, that you are transparent and that there are no other hidden agendas, more or less, if you want to put it that way. And I think, Lastly, consistency and integrity also comes together. You really have to walk your talk and always have to remember that the, your word is really all that you have. So those were key uh, aspects of my venture into the executive search world come from the music and fashion um, industry. And these points really did open doors for me and uh, really did help build the network uh, of clients and uh, and uh, relationships that, that I have built uh, over the years. Now, talking about executive search uh, as a whole, clients are looking for a particular kind of uh, profile. At times we can say impossible profiles, you know, uh, and then how do you make the match and how do you actually bring the right candidates to the right organization. One thing is there are enough candidates that you can actually identify. How do you actually attract them? How do you make, because how do you get the candidates to be attracted to the opportunity to leave their comfort zones, right? Because at times a lot of these candidates that we approach some of them are actually looking for new opportunities, but a lot also not necessarily looking for a new opportunity. They might be open for a conversation, but how do you then basically attract them to your clients and make that opportunity an interesting one for them to even consider? Bridging that is key. What is the value proposition? But I think also most importantly, what I've noticed is it's the first few minutes of a conversation, right? Uh, especially working purely with senior executives, um, the, your life experience, your communication style is so important. I say within the first 30 seconds to 
30 seconds to a minute, you need to get someone to feel comfortable enough to actually drop their guards and feel that they're just having a normal conversation. And that, for me, I think it's really the point where if you can break that ice, you really are able then to understand what is it actually that could attract this executive in the opportunity that you're actually proposing? What is the life choices that they need to make or they wish to make? And how will that align to what your client is looking for? What are the characteristics of this individual and that to the person, the people that they will actually be collaborating with and working with? But most importantly, what makes this individual get up every day to do what they do? And what gives them, what fulfills them? What is the passion? What is the purpose? So gaining that level of trust in the communication from the onset is so important. And how do you do that? You also need to give a bit of yourself during that first round conversation. That person needs to feel almost slightly so open enough towards you that the conversation is not just a business conversation anymore. It's really about an exchange. It's really about feeling that you can actually reach this individual at the same time they feel they can share what their life, their possible next steps are and feel that they can actually get your advice as well on would this be the right next step. If you can achieve this level of communication, you can actually much easier make them out. And from a client's perspective, it's about really understanding the client. It's about taking time to learn about your clients, understand what their strategies, their long-term vision uh, is, and keeping in touch over periods and periods of time on what they're actually doing and how do you then find people that can actually uh, align, basically, with that long-term vision okay so building trust and bringing partnerships between clients and senior executives together it's about aligning people's vision their life mission the purpose and their passion and to do that you need to be open authentic transparent and show great communication skills a certain broad level of life experience that shows that people can communicate with you in a more open-minded manner. I think that's what I would like to share. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Dan. And I'm going to move beyond that. And I want to first of all bring in Alex uh, because he has some experiences. What happens when trust breaks down in a business, number one? And how do you actually bring it back? I mean, how do you rebuild the trust which is broken? Uh, Alex, would love to have your inputs on this. And after that, I would like to go to Greg after Alex on this again, because Greg, I know you're in, you've are you been with AI, so that gives a unique perspective too. But Alex, first with you, please. Thank you very much, Aditya. Well, uh, uh, indeed, I'm chairing a company that was uh, the biggest financial scandal in the history of the country, billions lost, many people with criminal charges and in jail. And um, luckily, the company didn't go bankrupt and uh, we managed to go through restructuring so the creditors will get still something 25 percent of what they invested but still better than zero uh, and the, the short answer to your question is when the trust is broken uh, most just confirming can everyone report. else hear alex just confirming can yep. others hear alex clearly or is it only yes okay now aditya disappeared Hopefully we'll get him back. Oh, get back. Uh, go on, please. Okay. Uh, so the short answer to what you asked for is um, you cannot restore trust. It's, it's practically impossible. If the trust is really broken in any human relationship, uh, it's very, very, very hard to restore. Uh, well, that, that deals with the fact that, again, on an evolutionary level, uh, well, uh, we don't remember the good events. If you look at history of some nations, I mean, even if you look at, at for instance, India-Pakistan relationship, or if you look at, you know, uh, Palestinians and Israelis, Jews and Arabs lived together peacefully for thousands of years. 
they even cross married, you know, they were friends, they were working together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then all of a sudden something bad happens, and then we just remember the bad thing. And this is again, this is justified because normal mundane years when people were working, going to, you know, uh, with the families to buy some stuff, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they are not important to our survival. What our brain is promoting is survival of the species is the fact that we are not eaten, that we can eat and we can pass our genes to the next generation. So we've hundred years together peacefully and this is gone and this is not really remembered, et cetera, et cetera. So you can restore trust, but not necessarily between the same people. There's very interesting work that was done uh, on the restoring trust between neighboring nations or neighboring tribes when you know, something really, really bad happened by remembering the good years, the good years that are normally forgotten. So for instance, there is a very interesting project on the boundary between Poland and Lithuania, when again, similar thing happened. There was World War II and people were killing each other. I mean, there were bad things happening, et cetera, et cetera. But before that, there was like thousand years of very, very friendly, nice common history. Eh? So there is a very interesting historian who started developing this common history project. And this common history project brought to the surface all the great things which were so much more important, which was so much bigger, which was so much, uh, but they were forgotten. They were forgotten because this is the nature of our brain, that we forget the good things. They are not important for survival. You know? They are not important. The bad thing, the danger is important. We have to avoid the danger. So we, we tend, it, this is some, but some psychologists says that, uh, say that we remember bad things five times more than good things. I don't know where they came, the num where they took the numbers from. It's probably, you know, even more. I believe that we remember bad things maybe 100 times more than the good things. And look what happened. You have a good marriage. People live together for 20 years. Everything goes reasonably well. They have kids. Then they get divorced. And now they hate each other. They never remember the good things. They just hate. They say, say bad things about each other. They just spit on each other. Yeah. And you think about it, what happened? How did they manage to live across these 20 years? Huh? And this is the nature again of our mind, of our evolution, of our psychology. So it's very, very hard to restore broken trust. You can find tools to help with that and you find tools to live with that. You can uh, come to functionality, but there's one more thing I just maybe finishing, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, a famous philosopher, once said, insanity is an exception for individuals, yet it is a rule for groups. And this is very true. So group have a tendency of falling into all sorts of this, of this functionality, any group, you know, maybe a business group, maybe, you know, a family group, etc., etc. Mostly groups are somehow dysfunctional. Eh? So if you combine this functionality of the group with a broken trust, you are facing a really, really hard work. Eh? So it is possible, it is possible to improve the situation. But so, so to, to go back to my company, we fixed everything. Yeah? Creditors get paid. We deliver on the promise. The wrong guys went to jail. Uh, you know, we, we deal with the financial authorities. Everybody should be happy. Nobody wants to do business with us now. Anyways, why? Well, because they remember the bad, bad years. Yeah? They remember the bad moments. They remember that they feel that still. So now the company is going through a process of changing the corporate identity, changing the corporate name, et cetera, et cetera, because we believe it's going to help. Because with the all get back name, still, you could be totally different group of people. You could be totally different business model. Still, people don't want to touch you. Thanks, Alex. Greg, over to you. Thanks, Aditya. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit more mundane approach to this. Uh, and, uh, and I, I of course, the, the saying that goes with trust is that it takes years to build it and seconds to lose it. And we've seen many examples of that in the world. Uh, and uh, and it, Volkswagen, very good, very good uh, example of that. And and have they been able to build it back up? To a certain extent, yes. And like Alex says, maybe it's with different people, but they're still selling cars. Um, some of their executives are gone and some of their executives uh, are still there. But I want to tell a, a little story uh, first about 
uh, a young executive who thought that um, that they knew everything uh, and could go and tell people how to do things. So this young executive went off to to Thailand and uh, and said, "This is the way that we do things, and uh, and you you will follow this rule." And then the young executive came back to uh, to uh, the head office, and when when uh, he got back to the head office, he found that uh, people were very unhappy back in the branch, and they'd sort of complained, and and there was a total lack of trust in that young executive. Uh, that young executive was me, uh, and and so there was a very big learning curve that I had to go through. And and so the the way that that I approached it to try and get the trust of those people back was uh, was twofold. One, it was to understand their culture, because the culture and this was actually Thailand. So the culture in Thailand is very different to the culture in Hong Kong, or very different from the culture in Indonesia or where else. So when you go to all of these places. And you want to instill trust, and you don't want to just lose that trust very quickly, and it will happen very quickly. Uh, you have to understand that culture. The second thing is to uh, take the bull by the horns. And so, in my case, what I did was I contacted the CEO, who was a very senior Thai, and and said to him, "I'm I'm really sorry. What did I do? What did I do wrong? And what should I now be doing?" And uh, of course, I got a dressing down, and uh, and then by changing myself, uh, we were able to build that relationship back up. So, so that that little story to me is is one of how uh, an individual, rather than a corporation, but an individual can can easily lose trust and has to do something to be able to get that trust back. Uh, and and I think. Uh, That when you when you have a, a corporate situation, uh, because you're in a joint venture, you're often in in a joint venture, uh, and, and I've been in numerous joint ventures. Uh, and these are not just startups I'm talking about. I, I'm talking about major corporations going into business with one another. Uh, and if you want to get that trust that may have been lost between the joint venture partners back, you know, when you get into a shareholders agreement, usually it says. Uh, there'll be certain representatives on the board uh, that you can put a manager in, or things like that. So what you have to do is you have to get rid of your people on the board and change the people on the board if your if your JV partner is unhappy. And most importantly, if you have a local manager, general manager, you get rid of your general manager. Don't wait around. Don't beat around the bush. Transfer them out. Get rid of them quickly. Don't try and, and defend the situation, because when you try and do that and you dig in, then you you have a much more difficult situation coming up. Um, I've I've been uh, very recently invited to go and sit on another board, and the reason I've been invited to go and sit on this other board is because the company had lost trust in the other director, uh, because this particular person was. Was doing things for their own interest. They had, uh, they were, in fact, they were going off to the regulator and telling, telling tales about the company to the regulator. So the company had no trust left in that person. And so what have they done? They've, uh, in this case, approached me to come in and try to restore trust with the joint venture partner. So I think these are, these are very important things that that one has to do. If you if you fail to act, your business partner is going to become obstructionist. They're going to fail to give you information, the, um, and actually, you might, if you're in a, a financial institution that's regulated, most likely, if you're with a local partner, you're going to alienate your local partner to the extent they go off to the regulator, and the regulator then starts to give you a hard time. So um, it's very difficult to rebuild trust, but it does happen. It can happen. You just have to work at it. Thank you, Greg. I would like to get a, a bit of a closing statement from from at least a couple of you, and I want to start off with Jesse. Jesse, how do you build trust? Because you started business in this COVID world, right? So, how do you build trust in in, in a COVID nineteen situation when perhaps you can't meet face to face? You, travel is not possible. People are in lockdown situations. How do you build trust in that? 
situation, Jesse. But just keep it to a minute, please, because we're a bit short of time. That's my one request. Thank you. Could you repeat the question? Sorry. <laughs> Jesse, OK. How do you build trust in a COVID situation where you can't meet people face to face? You have travel issues. Lockdown is happening. There are there's the xenophobia coming in. How do you build trust between companies and between organizations in this time? You mean during COVID, right? OK, OK. Uh, yeah, I, I have some many experience, you know, during the past uh, 